Welcome back. We are going to finish our uh, chapter one, section one presentations with a discussion on short-term investments. And we've already discussed these a bit. Let's look at them in detail. To review, they are also called cash. Now, that's a, not a, the best term, but that's what people will say. You got your money in the market? No, no, no. I'm fully in cash. I'm waiting for the market to crash, and I'm going to take all my money out of cash, meaning out of the savings account or out of the money market account or the treasury bills, and put them into stocks or whatever. Also called short-term vehicles, short-term uh, instruments. As we said, short-term usually means up to a year, depending on who you're talking to, but it could be two or even three years. They are almost always guaranteed or pretty darn close, folks. And as we said, I'm pretty sure I said it, if the organic matter hits the ventilating device, something bad happens and it looks like these short-term investments that are not technically guaranteed are going to go under, somebody comes to the rescue and makes sure that the investors don't lose any money. They're very liquid. Some will let you write a check or electronically deposit the funds right into your account. So hence, you have a very, very low risk of losing principal. They're guaranteed or pretty darn close. And of course, you're going to get very low reward for that <laughs> little risk. And as we said, two, three, four, five percent over time, but currently they are paying almost zero, and some are even paying zero. They have basically said, look, these things are paying so little amounts of money that we're not getting anything for handling your money, so we're not going to pay you anything. Now, most of the time, they'll give you 0.01% or something like that, just to make you feel good, which means you get, you know, a few pennies, <laughs> literally a few pennies. And so the others who are more more honest about it say, well, you're not going to get a dime, we're not getting any money, you're not going to get any money. We like to call these short-term investments a place to park your money. And they are also a place where you need to hold an emergency fund. If you have an emergency fund, and we'll we throw a slide in here. It's actually a slide from the financial planning and money management class. But we talk about an emergency fund, and this is the darling of the financial media. So let's take a look at slide 56 and discuss the interest on short-term investments. The Interest that is paid by savings accounts and money market uh, mutual funds is the stated rate of interest. That's the most common form of interest. That's what we're used to. Uh, we we put $100 into our savings accounts, and if we're getting 1%, which we're not these days, it means we're going to get a dollar. But for many other short-term investments, they use what is called the discount basis. It's a method of earning interest on a security by purchasing at a price, purchasing it at a price below its redemption value. And the difference is the interest earned. So, so you buy it for $99 and you get it back, you get $100 back. And the interest accrues. That's the word we use, accrues. And if you, if you've taken, um, uh, uh, accounting, you're familiar with that word. It means grows. It means it, it gets bigger. It accrues on the investment up until the day of redemption, at which case you get the full amount that you were told you were going to get. So, treasury bills, corporate paper, what a silly name. Relax, we'll take a look at those in a bit. Uh, these work on the discount basis. You purchase the security for $4,800, right? And it's a nine-month short-term investment. And in nine months, you redeem it for 5000 And the interest would then be 200 bucks. You understand? And as it gets closer and closer to that redemption date, the, the, the value of the security is going to go up uh, and eventually reach 5000 You understand? That, that's how it works. Um, People have a tendency to, to go, huh, I don't understand. But don't worry, you don't have to try to calculate the interest it, rate. It's going to tell you. It's going to tell, say that this 
uh, treasury bill pays two percent or pays point two percent or whatever. So you don't you don't have to worry about uh, uh, what am I actually getting? What's my rate of return? They will tell you what your rate of return is. Slide fifty seven. Now, what are the risks of short term? And wait a minute, Piano. You told me these things are risk free. Well, it depends on what type of risk we're talking about. Are you going to lose your money? No. There's no risk of default, or almost none. You're not going to have a capital loss. Your principal is safe, often guaranteed, or pretty darn close. But are there other risks? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You can lose purchasing power. Huh? Yeah. If you put money into a savings account at 0.1%, and inflation is running at 2% or close, 1.8 or something like that. Your, 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 your investment is actually losing money. Now, you don't see it go down, but the amount of purchasing power it has the next year is less. So it's eventually, you're essentially losing money. Yeah. And, and, and also, if you have a long-term perspective, you could have done a whole lot better by investing in something, um, you know, that had, you know, prudent, prudently, but that's the word we use. Don't go hog wild. Don't, don't roll the dice. But you could have done a whole lot better. And so you have a high risk of lost opportunity costs. You understand? Unless your time horizon is very short, there are several investment alternatives, almost all of which will give you a better rate of return. So, I want you to repeat after me. <laughs> there is no, there is no such thing, such thing as a risk-free read investment. Yeah, all investments have risk. Now, are you going to lose your money with a short-term investment? No. But can you lose purchasing power? Yes. Can you lose opportunity costs? Yes. And you need to know these things. Slide 58. Now, let's turn our attention to some of the types of short-term investments. Deposit accounts. Passbook savings accounts. Well, they don't really call them passbook savings accounts. Very rarely do they give you a little passbook. It looks like a passport. But some people still get them. I, my understanding is that they still, some companies still, banks still use these. Uh, at the credit unions, they call them savings accounts, but, but legally they're share accounts. That's their name. But don't worry. Everybody calls it a savings account. And a checking account that pays interest? Well, what's it called? It's actually called a checking account that pays interest, but the real name is a now account, negotiable order with, nobody calls it that, folks. And what about money market deposit accounts? Yes, the banks and the credit unions will have money market accounts. Now, these sometimes give you check writing privileges, and they'll give you a better return than your savings account. Not much better, but normally better. And... These are guaranteed. These money market accounts at banks and credit unions, just as the savings accounts and the checking accounts, they are guaranteed. They are um, sometimes called demand accounts since the funds are available upon demand. They provide the highest level of liquidity and are usually guaranteed up to $250,000 by the government or government agency. So when you walk into a bank, you'll see FDIC which means Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That entity is guaranteeing that if you, the bank goes under, for whatever reason, whether they make bad loans or somebody steals the money, or some, you, you're going to get your deposits back. Now, notice that there is a limit, $250,000. Well, that's you know, a lot of money for most of us, but that's the limit that they will, uh, they will guarantee. Make sense? Okay, good. And, and if it, the, the credit union, it's not the FDIC, it's the NCUA, National Credit Union Association, I'm not sure. But it's still, it's an agency of the federal government. Your money is safe. No matter what anybody says, the, no, they're all crooks. Yes, I agree. But, but no, your money is safe in a bank. 59, series, slide 59, EE -E savings bonds. Well, these are popular gifts for newborns. Um, you probably have some, you young uh, the millennials uh, somewhere, some your parents put it in a desk drawer somewhere and promptly forgot about it. Well, it's, it's time to pull the, that guy out and cash it in. Why? Because 
You don't pay any income tax on the interest until they're redeemed. But if you use it for higher education purposes, for tuition and the like, they are free from federal income taxes. Very cool. How do these work? Well, they use the discount method. You buy a $100 bond for 50 bucks. Now, can you turn around and redeem it for $100? No, you have to wait 18 years or 20 years or whatever. And if you calculate that rate of return, it's pretty low. And they'll tell you what they're paying at, at any given time. Uh, I'm not a big fan of these, but they are used as gifts to newborns. And then when you go to college, but the problem is you forget it. Man. Anyway, slide number 60. Along with the Series EE are the Series HH bonds, which are being phased out. Um uh, and uh, you can no longer purchase these things from the Fed. That you, I don't know if you can. I don't think they're transferable. The HH. I'm not sure. You're going to look that up when you go to uh, TreasuryDirect.gov. And then the Series I bonds, inflation index bonds, very popular. Why? Because they're guaranteed to outpace inflation. Well, anytime you hear guarantee, you know, yeah, sure, they're going to outpace inflation, but not by much. So, but if you think inflation is going to going to rear its ugly head in the near future, wow, wouldn't that be a great place to put your money? And a lot of people do uh, buy these things, believing that inflation. Of course, so far <laughs> it has been no inflation. But uh, uh, I know you look at the price of gas and and uh, milk and say, oh, there's inflation. No, 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 no. Wages are still stagnant or falling. Housing is still falling. Yeah, inflation is. Yeah, it may come back. It will come back someday. We don't know, but um, we'll see. Uh, notice that there's a maximum purchase of 30000 per year. Um, they're free from state income taxes, and they're free from federal income taxes if you use them for higher education. And and part of your assignment, folks, is to look these things up on uh, for the, your uh, assignment for Chapter 1 uh, on treasurydirect.gov. So check these these guys out. Slide number 61, Treasury bills. There we go, folks. These are the um, benchmark, if you will, for all other investments. They are obligations of the United States Treasury. Now, don't confuse them with Treasury bonds. We'll discuss bonds later on. But these are sold at a discount and then redeemed at face value. And they typically have one, three, six-month maturities, and they sometimes talk to them about weeks or days. And, and you're going to look them up, so you're going to see these. They're paying hardly anything, folks. Almost nothing. Uh, generally regarded as the safest of all investments. Remember the risk-free rate of return? Right. We look at the treasury bills to find out what the risk-free rate of return is. And you, dear students, dear potential investors, can buy these directly from the Treasury at the same price that the big boys and girls on Wall Street get. So so this is very cool. We complain when the government does something bad, right, right? But we should uh, give them kudos. We should uh, praise them when they do something good. And, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, they did a pretty darn good job on TreasuryDirect.gov. And that's part of the reason why I want you to take a look at it. So you can measure it against other investment websites and say, well, how do they compare to the Treasury Direct? Mm -hmm. Slide number 62, CDs. No, not music CDs. Certificates of deposits. Hmm, what are these things? Well, they're, you can think of them as fancy savings accounts, really, folks. But unlike a savings account, you uh, agree to hold the deposits for seven days. Or, or a month, or six months, or two years. And what happens if you need the money before that date? Right. You're going to get hit with a penalty for early withdrawal. So, so why would you bother? Well, they're going to pay you better than a savings account. And they normally pay better than money markets, but not much. They're insured to that same $250,000 per investor. And there are brokered CDs which are sold through brokerage firms, normally offering higher yields, sometimes very high yields. And they could be uh, bought and sold as like another, another security without incurring the penalty. Wait a minute. Why would a bank want somebody to broker their CDs? It means they're hard up for money and they need deposits. So they're willing to pay more and they're willing to uh, ask brokers 
to to get the word out and find investors. So more risk, more return. Now, now, wait a minute. Are they guaranteed? Yeah, they're still guaranteed, folks. Don't worry, you're not going to lose your, your your deposit. But you might get a friendly letter from the FDIC saying um, you, the Bank of uh, Podunk, uh, North Dakota, that you uh, put a CD in. Well, it's gone bust, and uh, we'll get your money back. Relax. But uh, as of this today, uh, we have placed the Bank of Podunk into um, receivership. And you'll be hearing from us. Be patient. Now you have to be careful with CDs because if you don't tell the bank or money or the or the credit union to roll it into your uh, checking account or savings account when the time is over, they will automatically roll it over for another six months or two years or whatever. So uh, yeah, they give you I think it's two hours between two two o'clock and four o'clock on the second Tuesday of no 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 they give you I think two weeks or something like that so you have plenty of time but beforehand you could say hey I want you to roll these things into my uh, savings account or checking account automatically slide number sixty three commercial paper what a silly name who comes up with these names. Well, these are short-term unsecured promissory notes, sometimes called IOUs, that are issued by corporations with very high credit standings. So you can think of them as the credit cards for um, uh, Honeywell or IBM or you know very GE, very large corporations uh, offer these uh, uh, commercial paper IOUs. They must mature within a year. Uh, it's 90 days, 180 days, 270 days, three, six, nine months. And the reason is by keep reason for this is by keeping the maturity less than one year, they don't have to register the security with the with the Securities and Exchange Commission. They don't have to go through the whole process of uh, of making this a public offering and all the rigmarole that they have to do. So so that's why they're short term investments. They're usually sold in multiples, excuse me, usually sold in multiples of $100,000. Hence, commercial paper is usually purchased by you and me. No, 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 no. No, commercial paper is usually purchased by uh, institutional investors, money market mutual funds, pension funds, or banks or other entities, life insurance companies that may need large infusions of cash. Or, um, or ha I'm sorry, they have large infusions of cash and need to park it somewhere. And so, if you go into a brokerage firm and say, "I'm interested in uh, finding out how much commercial paper is paying these days," their eyes are going to light up. They're going to get so excited, and they're going to bring out the coffee and the champagne and the caviar because they're going to think you're worth, you know, millions. And when you tell them that you're doing it for your introduction to investments class at community college, they'll, they'll quickly. <laughs> Excuse us, we, we have more important things to do right now. You're, you know, so. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, they're cousins. Bankers acceptance notes, slide 64. These are the equivalent to commercial paper, but they're issued by banks. And they're short-term, low-risk investment vehicles arising from bank guarantees of business transactions. Huh? Well, if you're not a corporation large enough to issue your own commercial paper, you'll go to a bank and say, you know, I need $90 million for, for 40 days or 60 days. And the bank will say, fine, here is our commercial paper. And uh, not our commercial paper, our acceptance notes, our banker's acceptance notes. And then you can just turn around and sell these on the open market, get the cash, and then you have to pay it back to the bank in, in 60 days or 90 days or whatever you set up for. So they're sold at a discount, just like the treasury bills and the corporate paper. And they're typically less than, than 90 days. They're typically less than three months. They're just for uh, uh, tra business transactions. And as with commercial paper, they're usually the minimum denomination of uh, $100,000. So they're, they're cousins. They, 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 they work together, commercial paper and bankers' acceptance notes. <coughs> now, <coughs> slide 65. Money market mutual funds. Well, a money market mutual fund is a mutual fund that pools the capital of a large number of investors, number of investors, and uses it to invest exclusively in short-term securities. So, so it's a mutual fund, 
But it's unlike other mutual funds in that other mutual funds are mostly for stocks and bonds and, and you know, these are, these are longer term investments. No, no, no. These mutual fund, mu these money market mutual funds are there just to buy treasury bills or corporate paper or bankers acceptance notes. And, uh, and, and because we can't buy them, we don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy these things. So, so, so we in, we pool our money together with other investors. And virtually all brokerage firms, all mutual fund companies offer them. Now, here's the big difference. You've heard the term money market, haven't you? Yes, you have. When we talked about money market accounts at banks and credit unions, where as those are guaranteed by the FDIC or the National Credit Union Association, money market mutual funds are not guaranteed. But they're still considered virtually risk-free. If there's ever a default, or if more likely the company loses a penny, and folks, that's what happens. They lose a penny. It's called breaking the buck. You can look it up, breaking the buck in any search engine, and you will see thousands of articles. What happens is the company will call the regulators and say, <laughs> uh, guys, we goofed, we lost a penny. Is it okay if we take our money, our own money, and put it into the account? Now, normally this is verboten, folks. This is forbidden. No se permite. You can't take your own money and mingle it with your customer's money. But in this case, the feds will say, no problem. And if they can't do it, if they're so hard up that they can't do it, other companies will step in and bail out the investors. Why? Because they don't want... They don't want their investors to think, well, that money market lost money. Maybe my money market will lose money. And in fact, in 2008, when the organic matter hit the ventilating device, and it looked as though things were going to be, and they did, they got really bad, the Federal Reserve Bank stepped in. The white knight came to the rescue and said, we will guarantee all money market uh, mutual funds for the next six months. And then they, they re-upped it for another six months. So for an entire year, Money markets were guaranteed by the Federal Reserve Bank, and, and they've got an unlimited amount of money, folks. So virtually all of these will offer you check writing privileges, direct transfer to and from checking accounts. They're a very convenient way. Now, what do they pay? They usually will pay better than savings accounts, but not always will they pay better than CDs. So they're sort of in between, but you know, usually, you know, decent amount. Right now? Yeah, right, nothing. They're all paying nothing. So, slide number 66. Which short-term investment is for me? Well, you can scratch commercial paper and bankers' acceptance notes because we don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest. Savings bonds, eh, they make cute gifts for newborns. Many investors, folks, purchase treasury bills directly from the treasury, treasurydirect.gov. You, with your $1,000, uh, can buy the same uh, security at the same price as the people who have millions or billions of dollars to invest. And certificates of deposits, I guess, are okay for those that are sure that they will ne not need the money until maturity. But if you need the money before the six months is up or the year is up, they're going to hit you with a penalty. Money market mutual funds, money market deposit accounts are, I believe, the preferred choice by most investors, especially since every bank, every credit union, every brokerage firm, every mutual fund company offers them. But what I've noticed is that most non-investors or people who, you know, say, I don't trust those crooks on Wall Street. I'm keeping my money in the bank. Well, how much do you have in there? $500,000. Oh, boy. And that's for my retirement. Oh, you're not going to need it for another 10 years. Oh, boy. Well, these people, they use a passbook savings account from a bank. Why? Because they haven't taken Business 123 yet. They don't understand that if the whole thing falls apart and there's no food at the, the, at the grocery store and there's no gas at the, at the, at the, at the gas station and, and, and there's no, uh, you know, the, the cell phones aren't working and the trash isn't being picked up and the firefighters are, there's no gas for the firefighters and the police and then the whole thing falls apart. Yeah, sure, your stocks and bonds will all fall down, but the money's in the bank. You can't get in the bank. The banks will be shuttered. There'll be armed guards in front of them. So, if that actually does happen, I'll meet you at the beach. I'll bring the vodka and the marshmallows. You bring the matches. We'll 
have a nice bonfire and watch the world burn. Slide 67. <laughs> the emergency fund debate. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that's all going to happen, folks, but it could. In which case, all bets are off. Should you have an emergency fund on slide 67? Now, this slide's right out of Business 121. Many financial experts recommend that households create an emergency fund of three, six, or even nine months of income. Now, I don't agree. Uh, I'm not trying to say you should keep just, you know, $18.76 in your checking account. No, no, no. But as long as you have access to cash via a line of credit for your house or credit cards is a worst case example, there's no good reason to keep $25,000, $50,000 or more in a savings account earning 0.1%, in my humble opinion. Instead, I would use that money to pay down high interest debt, especially credit card debt. Now, sure, keep a few thousand if you can into a couple of thousand or so if you can build that up. But 50000 in a say, yeah, 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 I don't, I don't agree. Uh, you do have adequate insurance, right? You have uh, health insurance and car insurance. and uh, yeah, right. But there, as with anything, there are exceptions. If you're a salesperson, you're self-employed, you get laid off, off often, you have seasonal work, oh, yeah, you need a serious emergency fund, folks. This is what happens to salespeople. When times are good, real estate, loan brokers, uh, car salespeople, and people are buying houses and making loans and buying cars, the money's coming in, no problem. They get accustomed to this level of income. And then 2008 happens. Right? And, 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 it's, like, and it's like falling off a cliff. They need those, those, uh, those uh, emergency funds. Okay. Uh, slide number 68. So we're now ready to check for comprehension. Got your, got your ABCDs? Well, no, you don't, but in the, in the face-to-face class, we would use these. It, what is a mutual fund that pools the capital of a large number of investors and uses it to invest exclusively in short-term securities? Right. Money market mutual funds. That's a very simple one. But what you'll notice is that the term mutual funds will, uh, not be used. People, people will just say money market. They won't say money market mutual funds. And remember that the money market mutual funds are not guaranteed, oh, pretty darn close, whereas the money market accounts at a bank or a credit union are. They um, have rates that are close to CDs without the early withdrawal penalty. Slide number 69. What are savings instruments in which funds must remain on deposit for a specified period? There is normally a penalty for early withdrawal. Time, right, CDs, right, certificates of deposits. If interest rates are going down, cool, you can lock in a good rate, and that rate will stay the same for two years or six months or whatever, but you better hope you don't need the money until the CD matures, or they're going to smack your hand and take your interest and maybe some of the principal. Slide number 70. What are short-term unsecured promissory notes, meaning that they're just like a credit card, uh, also called IOUs, issued by corporations with very high credit standing, usually sold in $100,000 denominations? Commercial paper. Commercial paper and their cousins, their siblings, bankers' acceptance notes are normally only purchased by institutional investors such as money market mutual funds, insurance companies, banks, and the like. And then slide number 71. A guaranteed demand account at a bank or credit union that normally pays little interest but will often be offered with a toaster or waffle iron, uh, which makes it all worthwhile. Yes, the uh, savings account, the share account, the passbook savings account. No comment, please. Don't like it to get the bankers too angry at me. Aha, <laughs> now. Slide 72. We are finished. We are finished with Chapter 1. So go back and study them all again, because learning is repetition. Yes. Um, make sure you understand more than anything else what is in the presentations. As you do, do read the book, don't get me wrong, Chapter 1 should be relatively easy to understand. Chapter 3, they go into too much detail, so be careful, read it, but don't get all bog down the detail, and then, of course, make sure you familiarize yourself with those short-term investments. Okay? 
great. I'm so proud of you. In our next chapter, folks, we cover probably the most important investment vehicle for especially you millennials, and those are mutual funds. Why? As we'll see, these things are ubiquitous. You like that word, ubiquitous? They're everywhere. And more than likely than, than not, you younger folks are going to have to use these to fund your retirement because that's what's going to be available through your uh, the business that you work for. Okay, see you in Chapter 4. But before we do, we want you to go back and make sure you've thoroughly immersed yourself in the material in Chapter 1. Good job.